Hey, 42 here. In 1904, the World's Fair was held in St. Louis, Missouri, to celebrate the Louisiana Purchase 100 years earlier, when the United States purchased the enormous territory of Louisiana from France for a pitiful sum of $15 million. Part of the celebrations was the holding of the 1904 Summer Olympics. This was the first time the still young United States had hosted the Olympics, and so it should have been the grandest sporting event of the century. After all, the fair itself was magnificent. But in actuality, the 1904 Olympics was the strangest Olympics in history and tells a story of poison, medical malfeasance and cheating so unbelievable you couldn't make it up. But before I reveal what really happened that year, do you want to know what I've always wanted to do? become a lord of my very own medieval castle. And that's exactly what I've been having loads of fun doing recently, playing Hustle Castle, who have kindly sponsored today's video. In Hustle Castle, you can build your very own castle and expand it exactly how you want to. Want to train peasants to become fearsome warriors? You can do that. Want to send out your fighters to battle orcs, giant skeletons and dragons? You can do that too. I've been having so much fun training up my castle dwellers to become powerful fighters. It's always exciting when you open a mythical chest because you can get epic purple weapons and sometimes, if you're really lucky, legendary orange weapons. I just got this awesome legendary axe which I used to absolutely destroy this boss. My tip to you is to always leave one of your dwellers in the training room to level up whilst you send your other fighters out to battle. What I love most about Hustle Castle is the engaging storyline. The characters are so funny and the animations have this really unique cartoon style which I just think looks absolutely brilliant. Oh, and the music is just so addictive. It really draws you in and makes you feel like a badass medieval lord. You can find my clan in game under the name 42. Be sure to hop into game, join my clan today and slay some orcs with me. Download Hustle Castle via my link below, enter your nickname and get a special bonus. For new players, 250 diamonds and 3,500 gold pieces. I know you won't regret it, and I'll see you in game. Right from the start, it wasn't looking good. Because of recent Russo-Japanese war tensions and difficulty getting to St. Louis, which involved a 1,000 mile train journey, the vast majority of the foreign contestants who were invited to compete failed to show up. One of the headline events was the marathon, but it turned out to be one of the most scandalous events in the history of sports. Let's set the ugly scene by taking a quick look at some of the marathon contestants. There were only 32 runners in total from four nations. Most were former Boston Marathon winners or hopefuls. But there were also some truly bizarre characters that turned up that year in St. Louis. Such as Fred Laws, a bricklayer from New York who did all of his training in the dead of night because of his profession. He won a paid trip to compete in the Olympic marathon as a prize for placing first in a local amateur five mile race. Then there were 10 Greek contestants who had never run a marathon in their lives, plus two members of the South African Tswana tribe who showed up in bare feet. And my personal favorite contestant was an absolute nut job from Cuba, Felix Cabajal, also known as Andarin Cabajal. Felix was a mailman who dreamed of competing at the Olympic marathon. So during his postal rounds, he would raise money for his trip to America, asking people to sponsor him. Remarkably, he was successful. And sure enough, in 1904, his bags were packed and he was on his way to St. Louis. But what did he do with all that sponsorship money? Well, he made it as far as New Orleans and spent it all on drinking and gambling. Yes, every penny. He was forced to make the rest of his journey by hitchhiking and trekking across the wilderness. At least it was good practice for him. This legend arrived at the starting post of the race dressed in a beret, long sleeve shirt, full length dress trousers and heavy hiking boots, completely opposite to the rest of the contestants who were sporting much lighter clothing and footwear. Felix took the smart decision to hastily cut the bottom half of his trousers off to fashion them into shorts before the race began. The course was 24.85 miles. 
The roads, if you can call them that, snaked up and down, punishingly steep inclines and declines across a total of seven hills. At one point, the route passed directly through the centre of town, across a busy road where runners had to dodge speeding two-way traffic and a horde of pedestrians. Most of the ground along the route was absolutely thick with dust and loose, jaggy stones that cut into the runners' feet. This dust would soon be the undoing of one particular contestant. To add insult to injury, it was a brutally hot August day, and temperatures soared up to 33 degrees Celsius. At 3.03pm, the starting pistol fired, and they were off. Immediately, the runners kicked up dry dirt and dust into the air, choking the lungs of everyone, even the spectators. To make matters even worse, these were the very early days of automobiles, and the event organisers had thought it a wise idea to ask the support vehicles to drive a few metres in front of the runners throughout the race. The car wheels, of course, kicked up a tremendous cloud of dust that the runners had no choice but to run directly into and breathe in. This asphyxiating cloud caused major issues. All the runners were struggling and had all slowed down way below their usual pace. The event organisers had only placed one water stop along the course, a water tower at the six mile mark, so they had very little opportunity to ease their suffering. As you will soon learn, there was a saddening and insidious reason the organisers only provided one water stop. Not long into the race, the combination of dehydration and dust clouds almost caused the first ever modern Olympic marathon death. After 19 miles, William Garcia of California collapsed at the side of the road and began coughing up copious quantities of blood. He would have died right there and then, if not for a passing bystander who picked him up and took him to the hospital, where it was discovered that the fine road dust had flooded into his lungs and coated his esophagus in a thick layer. It had also destroyed his stomach lining and was eating away at his insides like sandpaper. He had a near-fatal internal hemorrhage. The dust caused another contender, John Lorden, to start vomiting, and so he gave up and went home. How were the South African runners getting on, you may be wondering? Not a lot better. One of them, Len Tao, had been chased miles off course by a pack of wild dogs, which is not typically something you see today on televised Olympic marathons. What about my spiritual hero of this story, Felix Cavajal? How was he faring? Well, I'm pleased to say, pretty well. Fred Laws, the bricklayer, was in the lead, but Felix was not far behind him in his cumbersome dress clothes. He repeatedly stopped at the side of the road to chat to spectators. When he reached the busy crosstown traffic section of the race, he flagged down a passing car. He had noticed they were munching on peaches, and Felix, rather fancying one himself, asked if he could have one, but they refused. So, Felix reached into the car, grabbed two peaches, and ran away. In fact, Felix was far more concerned with devouring fruit than actually winning the race. You know, that very race he had begged and fundraised just to be a part of. Because a little while later, having finished his peaches, he ran off the road into a nearby orchard and ate a few apples he plucked from a tree. Little did he know before it was too late, they were rotten inside and gave him awful stomach cramps. So, he curled up on the floor and slept them off. This allowed another runner, Sam Meller, to overtake him, and so he and Fred Laws were now in second and first place, respectively. But then, Meller was also attacked by a bout of stomach cramps, probably from the dust, not rotten apples. So, just gave up on the race. Then, at the nine mile marker, Fred Laws, still in the lead, also succumbed to stomach cramps and exhaustion. Did he give up? Not quite. He jumped into one of the support vehicles at the side of the road and caught a lift for the next 11 miles, after which he got out of the car and ran the remaining 4.85 miles back to the finish line at the stadium, acting coy as though his automobile-based shortcut never happened. He confidently waved at the pensive crowds and ripped through the unbroken tape of the finish line to claim first place. His time was three hours, 13 minutes. Laws initially acted as though he hadn't cheated, but then a spectator came forward just as the president's daughter 
Alice Roosevelt was lowering a wreath and gold medal around his neck to the adoration of cheering crowds. The spectator loudly uncovered his 11 mile car journey and Laws quickly changed his tune. He claimed he had only done it as a joke and never intended to actually claim the win. Sure. The crowd instantly began booing him and the officials revoked his win. So who was the real winner of the 1904 Olympic marathon? Well, that would be Thomas Hicks, an English-American brass worker from Massachusetts. At 10 miles in, Hicks was exhausted, severely dehydrated and begging for water. He passed the only water stop four miles ago, but no matter how much he pleaded with his two handlers for a drink, they point blankly refused. All they did was sponge out his mouth with warm water. The reason? Well, the event's chief organiser, James Edward Sullivan, one of the founders of the Amateur Athletic Union, was secretly using the race as an experiment on the effects of forced dehydration. That's why he had only allowed one water stop at six miles and chose a chokingly hot and dry summer day for the run, along a route that he knew was perilously dusty and strewn with rocks. The evil bastard had ideas that purposeful dehydration would somehow allow athletes to perform better. Of course, we now know it to be quite the opposite and dehydration can all too easily be fatal. So, Hicks was being refused water and had a warm, damp sponge shoved into his mouth. But it gets even worse. His handlers then made him drink a homemade mix of egg whites and strychnine. Yes, what you're thinking is correct. Strychnine is a poison and a deadly one of that. It only takes a small dose to kill a man. You see, at this time, the Olympics, and most professional sports events for that matter, had no anti-doping laws. It wouldn't be until 1928 until the first such rules were introduced. And it was commonly believed that in small doses, strychnine was a stimulant that enhanced athletes' performance. Strychnine works by interfering with and stopping the nerve signals that communicate with the muscles in your body. Slowly, the muscles, including the heart, shut down. Now, it may just be me, but isn't a poison that shuts down muscles the very last thing on the planet you would want to give a runner only a few miles out from the finish line of an Olympic marathon? Sure enough, the poisonous cocktail began to ravage Hicks' body and shut it down. He had to be held up by his two handlers, which at this point in time was also not forbidden in the Olympics. They were practically dragging him along, with his limp legs drooping and his feet trailing behind him in the dust. But hearing news that Laws had just been disqualified from the race, and with the first place still up for grabs, Hicks found a second wind. His trainers thought, fantastic, what a wonderful opportunity to poison him yet again. That's right, at this point they gave him yet another deadly cocktail of strychnine and eggs. This time they allowed him a swig of brandy to wash it down, and they rinsed off his body and head with warm water. With his muscles locking up and beginning to spasm, and his complexion as pale as death, Hicks fought through the poison, dust and heat, and over the last two miles of the race, his pace began to quicken. Hallucinating, he thought that the finish line was yet another 20 miles away. He repeatedly begged his handlers for water and a rest, but they refused and continued to push him along. By the time they reached the stadium, his handlers practically carried him across the finish line. Nevertheless, he was declared the winner. Not that Hicks knew about it, he had collapsed on the floor, inches from death. But mercifully, he was saved by four doctors, and an hour later, he had regained his composure and consciousness. Hicks won with a time of three hours and 28 minutes which is the slowest Olympic marathon time in history. In fact, the second slowest was a whole half hour faster. Demonstrating how utterly bizarre and punishing to all of the contestants, this 1904 event truly was. Our good old Cuban friend, Felix Carvajal, had now woken up and despite pissing about pinching peaches for motorists and taking a nap, he still managed to come in fourth place, though his finishing time is unknown. It's thought that if he hadn't have taken a nap, he probably would have won. So 
The winner of the United States' first Olympic marathon was a man who was poisoned twice along the route, and he was only slightly ahead of a man who cracked jokes with bystanders and took a nap under a tree. What an absolute shambles the 1904 Olympic marathon turned out to be. But my god, I don't think there will ever be another one quite like it ever again. Thanks for watching. And thanks again to Hustle Castle for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to download the game using the special link in the description.